So hello, um, thanks for joining. I first session after lunch. So this, this talks on hacking our processes. So first off, quick show of hands, who's on an agile team? Most of the room. Uh, and do you use Scrum or some variant of Scrum? Awesome, most of the room, cool. Um, so again, uh, just hands up quickly. Um, how many of you would, you would say that process stuff is like part of your primary role? Like explicitly your job is to care about processes. So far fewer hands. Interesting. Um, so I'm guessing that's scrum masters, maybe tech leads, maybe team leads, maybe project manager type people. Um, but that's really interesting because one of the main tenets of Agile is to empower the people who are doing the work. So it says something that straight away we've got a lot of people that do Agile but not a lot of people who are actually explicitly told they can care about the process. So part of the point of this talk is to tell everyone that you, you can and you should care about your processes, and you can and you should improve them. So we, we know from Agile that the more people we have in the room, the more people who are part of the discussion, the better the inputs they'll we'll get and the better outcomes we'll get from it. So a lot of people don't know that they're empowered, but I'd say yes, like you should care about processes, you should be part of it. So sometimes um, you'll get pushback for doing this, uh, especially if the changes you try and make are big. Um, sometimes it's not sure how to get started uh, or where, you know, what to do. So basically what this talk's gonna give us is I've got some, uh, some suggestions and some things that I've done in previous teams. Uh, and we'll talk about how to design your own hacks for teams as well. So this talk is Hack Your Processes. So hi, I'm Richard. Um, I'm an independent coach. I started as a developer. I then went through the you know, junior, mid-level, senior. Um, then I started leading teams. Uh, and then I started um, moving into coaching. So that's now what I do all the time. I'm an in independent consultant. I coach teams, helping them improve their software delivery. So if you want to email me, my email's on every slide, actually, just in case you know, make it easy to find. Um, I'm on Twitter. You can find me there. And just come and say hello as well. Um, I don't know if we'll have time to do questions. I prefer to just talk to people one-on-one -on -one anyway. Uh, we'll see how we get on. So in this talk, we'll look at a few things. So we'll start by just running over a typical off-the-shelf Scrum, just to make sure we all have the same starting understanding. We'll look at some of the guiding principles, um, some of the sort of like things that can help us when we think about what might be an improvement or what might be a bad direction to go in. There's three main ceremonies for, for Scrum. Uh, which are the stand-ups, the retrospectives, and planning. So we'll look at some hacks we can do, some off-the-shelf things that, that are nice small changes that we can try for these three ceremonies. And then we'll look at designing your own hacks. So a lot of teams start with Scrum. So Scrum's very sort of neatly packaged. Um, if a team wants to switch towards being agile from whatever they were doing before, Scrum's an easy place to start. So there's obviously the Scrum Guide. It's a very prescriptive uh, framework you can use. It, it gives you something. If you've got nothing, you can drop in Scrum and you have something. And it's a pretty reasonable process. So it normally looks a bit like this. So you split up your time into sprints. They're typically about two weeks, sometimes more, sometimes less, but two weeks seems to be an average. In that two-week sprint, you'll do a bunch of tickets. So you prepare those in advance. You might hear that called grooming or planning or uh, other names for it. But basically, you prepare a bunch of tickets that you're going to put into that sprint. You normally estimate them. So you normally have some idea of how big the work is so that you can try and work out what a reasonable amount of work is to do in the two weeks in the sprint. So once you know how much you can fit into the sprint, you talk about priority. You talk about which ones you want to fit into this sprint, so which ones are the top of the tree, most important things. Then every day, the team will have a stand-up, um, which is a, a a meeting where you stand up to make it take less time, and you talk about what's going on uh, with the work that you're doing in the sprint. At the end of the sprint, you look back on how you did, so you see, uh, see what you did, and then you have a retrospective, which is where you loop back and you try and improve. So you find things that you could do better next time, and then you know, talk about how you can improve those things. So that's probably pretty familiar, because most of you said you do Scrum in some form. So there are traps, though. One of the things about uh, Scrum in particular is it looks quite familiar to people. So lots of teams switch um, almost cold turkey. So you can do uh, certification courses that are very short, like you know, two days and you're a Scrum master. Um, that's not a lot of time, actually. Um, and 
uh, it looks familiar. So if you're used to doing a big sort of phased, uh, you know, multi-month um, delivery, then if you kind of like, if you don't know any different, then Scrum can look like the same thing, except that you're doing lots of short projects. So each, each two-week sprint becomes a two-week project. So you still have the phases within that, or even, you know, phases for each ticket. Um, so some of the traps, the most common one is, is cargo culting. So I love this picture. It's uh, from uh, the Pacific Islands in the 40s and 50s. So cargo culting is where the people on these Pacific Islands hadn't really seen Western civilization much before. And suddenly at the end of World War II, you had the American air bases uh, coming into town. And these are essentially hunter-gatherer people. Um, so they, they live around finding resources. And suddenly there's this bunch of people who land. And when they do these magic dances on the runway, um, food falls from the sky, and that's pretty cool. So these, these civilizations, they don't know really what makes the food fall, but they try and do the things that will make it happen. So they copy the things that they can see. In this case, they built a wooden plane. There's lots of very cute pictures of people with like wooden headphones and stuff trying to make the food fall from the sky. Um, they don't really understand what makes the food fall from the sky, but they, they think if they do the things, it will happen. Um, and then I'm not really sure what will happen next, but we can kind of guess. Uh, probably it won't fall from the sky. But we see this all the time. So we th see things like the, you know, the, the Spotify model just being like, dropped into a team because it works with Spotify. But if you look at like, why it works with Spotify, it's actually quite deep. There's quite a few things that they do um, on a cultural level and organizational level that make it work. And, and you see this quite a lot with agile things um, and all these like, leading edge processes. Uh, and they get dropped in without sort of bits that really make them work. Um, so I'd, I'd say that actually one of the most dangerous things that you can say about any of this type of stuff is I already know that. Because the chances are there's some nuance to it that you've missed. So beyond the sort of the, the, the naive side of like just not understanding which bits matter and which bits don't, um, a lot of teams are running into this as well nowadays, um, which is known as dark agile. Um, so you'll hear some of the original founders of agile talking about this quite a lot, where the things that they'd created to try and help teams are now being used against them. So in particular, we see this around things like transparency, things like estimation in particular, where people are now being held, you know, held to account for their estimates. Um, so a lot of this comes from the sort of, um, they've changed their processes, but they haven't changed their thinking. So obviously, a lot of management 50 years ago or 100 years ago was based around Taylorism and scientific management, which, which was the idea that there was you know, a, a right way to do things. And the clever manager would tell the team what that right way was and then basically make sure the team did as they're told. Um, turns out that's not really particularly effective in knowledge work. It can actually have the opposite effect quite strongly. Um, but what you tend to see in that environment is actually things just don't work. So the managers just push harder because that's how they think they get results from people. So you, you see people um, you know, micromanaging each ticket uh, and, and just basically these constant, each sprint becomes a fresh deadline. So you used to have this problem of having a deadline every three months. You've now got it every two weeks. So I want to tr try and show you some ways to avoid that. So the easiest way to avoid those things is to try and understand the principles behind why we do these things in the first place. So let's look at some guiding principles. So all of these are straight from the Agile Manifesto. The first principle is individuals and interactions over processes and tools. So one sort of brand of getting this wrong is to say that it's only the thing on the left and not the thing on the right. So I'm talking to you about processes because every team has processes, whether they're implicit or explicit. You all, you all have a way of working as a group that you all share. That's your process. It can be formal. It can be informal. It can be prescriptive, it can be relaxed, but you have a process. So if we're going to tweak our processes and, and tweak our tools, then we want to try and do them in such a way that supports the interaction. So anything that encourages people talking to each other, encourages people working together, is probably a good thing. Anything that replaces that is probably a bad thing. So an example of one you could use would be stuff like pull requests in Git. Um, like it's there, it's a tool. If you're a remote team, it's your only tool. But it's replacing an interaction. So I would, I would contend that if you're thinking of doing code reviews, you might be worth trying pairing or trying some more collaborative method instead. So whenever you're looking at these things, try and look for a way of getting the result you want in the way that encourages the right thing. 
And then the other sort of side of this as well is that every team has their own needs. So just because you started with an off-the-shelf framework like Scrum doesn't mean you should follow that forever. It's a good starting point, but that's all it is, it's a starting point. So you need to be thinking all the time about what's our team's needs, what, what do our people need, what does our business need, what do our customers need. And sometimes um, little changes to the, to the framework can go a long way in fitting your needs. So the second of the principles is working software over comprehensive documentation. So again, this doesn't mean like no documentation. This means prefer working software. So the number one thing to look for here is try and get feedback on real world things as soon as you possibly can. So putting something in front of a person and getting them to tell you what they think of it will always be a plan every time because they're telling you what they actually feel and what they actually see. And if you ask people what they, you think they might want, they don't know. But if you ask them, do you like this thing, they'll have a good idea. So this also goes for internal documentation as well. So one of, the, one of the biggest ways you can mess up this principle is by having this very gated approach within your team. So if you have, uh, for example, business analysts, it's a real challenge to make sure you get that interaction right. Again, focused on the interaction, um, where you don't just have these tickets being written up as like you know, stone tablets and then handed down to the developers, but try and encourage um, feedback in that process, basically. So try and focus on the things the customer needs um, instead of just things that don't add to them. So again, a classic example of something that doesn't perhaps add to this is estimates. Like the customer doesn't know whether you estimated or not. So if you spend like two or three hours a week estimating, then you're not spending two or three hours a week on anything else. So look for anything within your process that doesn't help the customer and question whether you need it. And the answer might be you do need it a little bit, but how little can you get away with? Then our last principle is, uh, is collaboration over negotiation. And this one's quite vague. Um, so you can see how this would work in perhaps an agency, um, but actually it applies in every team as well. So whenever you're agreeing something up front and promising to stick to that thing, you're essentially reducing what could be a collaboration down to negotiation. So again, the thing to do here is to look for feedback loops. So can you show people um, something that they can interact with and then build that feedback into the next phase, and that becomes a negotiation. So you might get a close working relationship with a product owner, for example, where you can say to him, like, I want a, a login form. You can you know, type away and show him, do you mean like this? Uh, could you make it a bit different in this way? Yes, that's turned into a collaboration now. Whereas if you just said, like, here's a perfect wireframe, go build it, that's a negotiation. And the more you can deliver early and often, the more you can build up this collaboration. So people ask for negotiation if they don't trust you're going to deliver. But if you can show something early, and you can show something again soon after, and something again soon after, then it actually it stops mattering how fast you're going and how, you know, whether it's right or not, because they know you can change. Um, so like a really cool example of this, um, we had a team I worked with who did continuous deployments, and they'd get uh, feedback calls from customers. And sometimes the feedback was so small that we'd actually fix it while they're on the phone, deploy it while they're on the phone, and say, like, refresh your page, is that what you mean? Um, so when people can see that frequent feedback, you don't need to provide like, estimates and uh, budgets and all the other stuff because people trust they're going to get what they need. So if you act on the feedback quickly as well, it, it just shows people that you're listening to them and it shows them that they'll get what they want pretty soon. So this also goes for an internal negotiation as well. So a lot of the negotiation teams end up doing is between different departments or between managers and teams. Um, so again, look for ways to work together and solve the problem together rather than like, just trying to force each other to agree to a, a certain commitment. Then the last of our values is responding to change over following a plan. Um, so again, if you're coming from a world of, of traditional project management where everything is kind of plotted out as a Gantt chart for the next six months, this is a pretty different way of thinking. So what you're trying to do in an agile process, you're trying to avoid overcommitting and avoid closing off options. So if, if a user told you tomorrow that actually they want something different, could you respond? And if you can, you're doing something right, and if you can't, you need to make sure you can. Um, so you should be constantly getting feedback that validates your direction and constantly able to act on it. And this comes down to things like um, building this into your design as well. So if, you, if, you need, if you're making a software system, you can make decisions in the architecture that either really help you or really get in your way later on. 
So a couple of the other sort of things to look for, all of these are from the original Agile manifesto. Um, this one, so Agile processes promote sustainable development. Um, you should be able to maintain a constant pace indefinitely. So if you're doing something to go faster today that will slow you down tomorrow, that's not really good. Um, because you do that enough, you're going to be stopped. So you need to ask yourself constantly, are you doing things that, will, uh, that you can keep doing? So if you're ending up working late or something, you can't keep doing that. You need to change what you're doing. The best, requ um, best architectures, requirements, and designs are emerge from self-organizing teams. So they're not prescribed, and the team are allowed to form them for themselves. So that's some sort of principles that were taken straight from the manifesto site. Um, if you look back at these, whenever you're thinking of a change within your team, try and favor the things that will, you know, the manifesto favors. So most teams plan their day around a stand-up. So let's have a look at some of the changes you can make to a stand-up. So the stand-up's really interesting, actually, because it sets the tone for a team. So if you just observe a team's stand-ups, you can tell a lot about that team, how they're working, what's probably going well for them, what's probably not going so well. One of the simplest things that absolutely everyone in the team can do, straight away, you don't need to ask permission or anything, that surprisingly few people do, is just prepare in advance. So lots of stand-ups, you hear people say stuff like, um, so yesterday I, um, I came to work on the bus and then I had my lunch and then I worked on ticket one, two, three, and then it means nothing to anyone, but they haven't thought it through in advance. They're just rambling because they're, you know, they're on the spotlight now, they have to say something. So if you literally just take a few minutes beforehand, just write it on a post-it, just what do you think you're going to share with the team, it can make a big difference. Uh, a post-it's great because it limits how much you can write. So you can't write your life story on a post-it. Think about what information you want to hear from other people and give the same information to them. So what do you care about, the things that affect you? So think about what things you're doing that might affect other people. Hopefully they're thinking about what things they're doing that might affect you. And then that means you can listen to other people and listen to what they're saying rather than just standing there nervously waiting for your turn to speak. Um, and as I say, so stuff like yesterday I fixed a bug. Cool, good for you, nice. Do I care? You know, does it mean anything to me? No, don't say it. The other thing that can really help with the, the structure of a stand-up is flipping the questions. So the stand-up normally has three questions, which are what did you do, what are you doing next, and what's in your way? But actually the most important of those by far is what's in your way. Because if you've got people in the team who are blocked, then someone's going to have to help them. So if you're going to have to help someone, then you're not going to do what you plan to do today. You're going to help them instead. So if you leave that till last, it ends up not ha having any time. And miraculously, like no teams that you hear doing stand-ups are ever blocked. And then you speak to them 10 minutes later, what you're doing, fighting a blocker. Um, the structure of the stand-up discourages people from saying things, which if you just flip the things around and start with, does anybody want any help today? And give people the opportunity to say so, then you probably find a lot more people do want help than, than you would otherwise. So then what's next is the next most important thing, because it might, you know, if you say I'm about to go do this thing, someone else in the team might recognize a problem with that. They might tackle you on it. And then the least important thing by far is what you did yesterday, because unless it changes what other people need to do today, it's gone, it's done, next. Walking the board's another nice little easy hack. So most teams end up having um, you know, people standing in a circle, and you go, you, know, you go, then you go, then you go, then you go. Um, and it's very much about the people. And that can mean that people feel like they're having to justify, like, what did you do yesterday? You know, why didn't you finish your ticket yesterday? Uh, it's not about that. You're, you're working on things together. And sometimes they take longer than you think. So if, if you switch, just uh, make it about the work instead. So you know, here's our top goal. What happened on that one? And then multiple people, multiple people might say what they did towards that goal. It changes the dynamic completely. Um, it doesn't cost you anything, just changes the dynamics. Um, you can also instantly see if there's any tickets that aren't moving. So if you've got a, something that no one's assigned to or that one person's assigned to and they're struggling, you can see it much more clearly if you look at it on a ticket-by-ticket -ticket basis than a person-by-person -person basis. And it keeps you remembering what's most important as well. So if you start from the most important ticket and you run out of time, well, that's kind of okay. Whereas if you start by going around the room and never get to the person who's working on the most important thing, then you don't even know what's going on. 
there's a lot of nuance to this one. We don't have infinite time. But pairing and mobbing, again, makes it a lot less about individual process. Um, so if you start working together, then you have people who will basically unblock themselves. Um, so if, you know, if I know one set of things and you know another, another set of things, and we work together, then the sets, the overlap of what we know now is much bigger. And you'll find that people just get le blocked less often because they know enough within the team to unblock themselves. Um, and again, this is a big topic. There's far, far, far more benefits on this. Um, another sort of thing to sort of notice with this is if people are working in mobs anyway, and the mobs are independent from each other, do you even need a stand-up? Like, if the mobs don't affect each other, and everyone within the mob knows what's going on, do you need to coordinate between them? And the answer is often no. So by default, most teams tend to have their stand-ups in the morning. Um, that is just a default for most people. But you end up with this really sort of weird thing sometimes where everyone comes in at different times, some people come in early to work on something, and you end up with stand-ups at like 9.30 or 10 o'clock or something. And you have this awkward like half hour window before that where you know you're gonna get interrupted, you know you can't start something big, but what do you do? Um, so try some other times. So actually, I, I did one project with a split team where half the team were in, actually, Minnesota, of all places, and the rest were in the UK. Um, so what we did was we had our stand-up at lunchtime because that was the morning in Minnesota and lunchtime in the UK. And a really nice side effect of that is because everyone was, had a meeting that they all came back to, everyone went to lunch together. Um, no one told them to, no one made them, but the amount of team building that went on, just by, you know, everyone goes to lunch together at one o'clock because they come back for the stand-up at two, very, very easy to make that change. Uh, another one that can be quite nice is if you have your stand-ups at the end of the day, then everyone can share their problems. So everyone can say, you know, I'm right in the middle of something right now, I'm, you know, I'm fighting against deployments or something. Um, then someone else might know the answer, or if no one does, then you've told them all that you've got the problem. And it's amazing how many of these problems get solved on the train home, um, because people are thinking about it in the background. Um, incidentally, another little thing, uh, if you find you are getting disrupted by meetings, give TDD a chance. Um, so TDD is the idea of working in very, very small feedback loops. You write a failing test, you make the test pass. If you get interrupted and you're doing TDD, then you know where to come back to because you either have no tests um, that are failing and you need to write a test that fails, or you have a failing test and you need to make it pass. So it's a very, very nice workflow. It gives you all sorts of other benefits, um, but it's also it's really, really good against disruption. So one of the things that often goes wrong in stand-ups is if you have a facilitator, and this happens in all the meetings as well, actually, but the facilitator can become the center of attention. So if, you have a, if you're a scrum master and you're in a situation, step back. So do things that stop people talking to you. So make sure you're, you know, break line of sight or break eye contact, just look at your shoes or something. Um, there's a funny sort of story on this. Uh, I had a, a scrum master I was working with, and he, he didn't get this for months. Um, so I actually one day made him wear a paper bag on his head uh, and he stopped doing it the day after um, because wearing a paper bag on his head and making the others not look at him, which actually they looked at him quite a lot that day, um, but just made the point to him, it's not about you. It's not about like, giving an update to a central person. It's about the team talking to each other. It's also really nice to rotate the Scrum Master or any facilitated duties around the team. So the more people know how to do this stuff, they, they learn what's important about it. They learn what makes the meeting go well or badly. So if you have one person who's always a scrum master, then everyone can kind of always go, well, that's always John's problem. Whereas if you make other people do it as well, then other people can have more of an understanding of why you're doing it and what the point is. Uh, try to avoid pressure situations. Um, one of the brilliant and nasty things is if people are giving long updates, people run a stopwatch, run a timer on them. That's horrible. Um, don't put people on the spot. You know, don't, don't ask them why they didn't finish their thing yesterday. It's horrible. Um, and if you've got politics, if you've got people point scoring and that kind of thing, just stop it. Get them out of the room. Um, it's the team's meetings for the team's coordination. If you've got people who've got any of these problems, it's your job to help them. So if you've got people who, who aren't giving coherent stand-up updates, talk to them five minutes before. Ask them what they did yesterday. Ask them what they're going to do today. Ask them if they're blocked five minutes before the stand-up and then they'll have an answer in their head for when it's their turn to talk. And then the last one on stand-ups is don't wait for stand-ups. 
So the, the point of a stand-up in the first place is it's the minimum amount of communication a team should do. So if your team don't communicate at all, a stand-up is much, much, much better than nothing. But actually, what's better still is to talk when you need to. So especially if you're blocked, don't wait, talk. Um, you, you need to get to a place in your team where you expect people to ask each other for help, where if you're blocked, you can always ask. And people might say, you know, give me half an hour and then I'll help you. But there's no point wasting like, hours or days just to get help. You, you need to do it straight away. So if you set up other collaboration mechanisms like Slack or something that people can ignore in the background until they need it, um, that's good. And what you'll find from that is if you're doing lots of collaboration when you need to, then the stand-up becomes a formality. So you know, at the stand-up, you can literally just say to people, is there anything else to share? Because if, they've already, you know, if you know they're sharing things anyway, then stand-up can, can take like 30 seconds. You, you just ask people, is there anything else? No. Fine. Cool. Go. Um, and that's quite a nice place to get to. And lots of teams are actually retiring the stand-up because it becomes no longer needed. Because if people are just mobbing anyway or working together anyway, then you just don't need it. So the next of our ceremonies, and I think this is the most important one by far, is retrospectives. So retrospectives are your mechanism for making change. Um, the ironic thing is that they're also normally the thing that's done worst, and they normally get dropped. Um, lots of teams have a bad time with retrospectives, which is a, a real shame. So the number one thing you can do to make your retrospectives better is to focus on improvement. So it's really, really simple. Just focus on what you can do better next time. That's the only thing you need to do. So don't hijack these things. Don't, don't turn it into a sprint review or don't talk about estimates and velocity and all that stuff. It's about what can you do better next time. So find something that you can do better next time. There might be many things, but just focus on one for now. Find something that can make it better. The simpler that thing is, the better, the more likely it is to happen in practice. And then just go do it. It's easier said than done. But that's the, that's the basics of it. You don't need to do anything else. You, know, you don't need like a half an hour exercise of gathering ideas and stuff. If you all know what's wrong, just say what you can improve, say how to improve it, and then get on with it. Capturing things continuously really helps as well. Again, uh, lots of retrospectives are designed around the premise of spending a lot of time capturing all the things that, that happened in the sprint. But the problem with that can be, like, if you, if you wait until the end, then you only remember the things that happened towards the end of the sprint. And the things that happened towards the end of the sprint were probably caused by something you did or didn't do early in the sprint. So by capturing things late on, you're losing the causes. So try and get in the habit of, of writing things down as you notice them. So if you notice uh, you know, the build's really slow today, write it down at the time. Because you know, on Friday, you might not notice it so much. Um, Try and make a note of which things cost you time and energy as well. So what's really interesting thing here is you might have something that's slowing you all down, but only one of you notices it. But if one of you notices it and says to the others, you know, just, you know, just tomorrow, just make a note of how much time you spend waiting for the build server, um, you might find out that like, that 10 minutes here and there adds up to many hours. Um, you know, if it just one of you thought about it on your own, you wouldn't notice the cumulative effect. But when you, when you get it in the bigger context and you've tracked it, then you know now that it's a problem. And also, if you've got an environment where you have to justify why you need to do things, then you can say to people, you know, look at this. We spent this much time yesterday on the build server. If we spend this much time tomorrow fixing it, that will go down. So if, again, it really helps with these things. If you can have evidence and, and you know, something measured that shows why things are important, you'll have a better time doing them. But number one, uh, I said number one already, but the other thing with retrospectives, make them often. So your goal as a software team is to have no issues, to have nothing that's slowing you down, no impediments. But if you're waiting a long time to talk about issues, so if you're only talking about what you can improve like every two weeks or, every, or worse, like cancelling retrospectives and going beyond, then the issues get bigger and bigger and bigger. But if you, if you um, talk about these things often, then you can nip them in the bud and you can find small improvements. So one of the things I actually quite like doing with teams, um, if they've got a lot of issues, switch to a daily retrospective, which obviously completely changes how the retrospective works. Because you ha you know, if you're going to do it every day, it can't take an hour. Um, but focus on just trying, trying to find one small thing that you can do tomorrow that will be better than it was today. And the smaller you can make that thing, the more often you can do that. It adds up to a lot. So if you have teams that have infrequent retrospectives, 
they tend to have a lot of issues and they tend to be big issues and then they're hard to tackle and they get deferred and they become bigger, just make the retrospectives more often. And this is one of the sort of number one uh, principles of things like DevOps as well, where just if something's hurting you, do it more because then it forces you to remove the pain. So the more often you have your retrospectives, the smaller they become. Don't moan. Um, retrospectives can be really grim if you have this guy in your room. You know, the guy who will sit and, oh, we've got no logging. I wish we had logging. Oh, oh, no logging. Go and put some logging in then. Like, okay, you've made your point. We hear you. You need to do it. Do it. Um, so just, you know, come up with solutions to these things, not just the problem itself. Like, anyone can come up with a problem. You can all see the same thing. But come up with some ideas and go do them. And if you spend your energy on that, you'll get better much fast. Um, another one is don't blame. Um, hopefully this isn't a thing for, for your teams, but it can be pretty nasty. So you, you need to basically focus on making an environment where people can't get things wrong or people are generally safe. Um, so if you find that a, you know, someone makes a mistake, someone deleted a prod database or something, they were able to do it. You, know, you can only delete the prod database if you have the credentials to delete the prod database. Um, so you've got a system problem there. So someone's been unlucky and they've run into that problem, but now they've brought it to your attention and you can fix it. So if someone's done something stupid, it's not that they've done something stupid. They've done something that your system and process let them do. But now you can see it, now you can fix it. And again, ask yourself, what could you have done to help it? Like, could you have spotted it was about to happen? Could, could you have joined in and helped them put it right afterwards? Um, so you know, sitting and blaming people is easy. What could you do about it? So this is a big block of text, sorry for that. But I don't know if you've seen the, um, the Prime Directive, which is this, this comment here from Norm Kurth, which is, regardless of what we discover, we understand and believe that everyone did the best they could with what they knew at the time, the skills and abilities, resources, and the situation. Uh, and that's generally true. Like, people are trying to do their best. Um, so don't, don't blame people, assume best intent, and fix the system that let it happen. And then, again, it's all very well talking about what's going wrong and talking about how to improve it, but you need to make sure it happens. So make sure you capture the actions you're going you're to try. Make sure they're visible. Make sure people know that these things, you know, you've agreed that this thing is a problem. You've agreed you're going to tackle it. You've agreed how you're going to tackle it. Make sure everyone knows that. So anything that's slowing the team down should be your top priority. So you need to make a link between your retrospectives and your planning. Like if you're going to try, write, you know, try doing TDD next week, then you need to account for the fact that, that that's going to take time. You're going to be doing something differently. Um, but if you have your planning as a separate exercise, then these things get lost or pushed to the bottom of the pile. And then you have the same issues come up next week and all the rest of it. And that's just sad. So ideally, if you can put these things visible somewhere that every, everyone can see them every day, that's great. And if you can track how they're going, that's good too. So sometimes just asking people at the stand-up you know, we said we were going to try more pairing this week. How's that going? Uh, it's just a reminder for people to, to make sure it happens. So the third of the main ceremonies in Scrum is the planning and grooming. Uh, and again, this one really sets the pace of, of how the team work. The biggest thing that a lot of teams do is they have the, the infinite backlog. You've all seen it. Um, so hundreds of items in the backlog um, that will go for months, maybe years. Some of them will never happen. Stop it. Um, try and focus on what you're going to do next. So what's the most important thing you can do right now? Because anything beyond that will probably change anyway. Like if you, if you work on the most important thing and you release it to customers and they say, I hate it, I need to change it, are you really going to not work on it again until it comes up to the top of the pile from the bottom? You know, you're, you're going to change your plan in flight. You should be changing your plan in flight. Expect it. Don't spend time talking about the future. So you probably want to capture some idea of a roadmap. You probably want the, the rough direction that you expect to go in. But just remember that it's the direction you expect to go in, not the direction you will go in, and it will change over time. So if you just talk about what you're going to do this week, that's good enough for now. And then next week, you can talk about what's most important next week. It might be what you thought it was. It might be something completely unrelated. Capture all the activity. So try and get every voice in the room. So one of the sort of big things as well is that if you have a product owner role, 
they become the only person thinking about priority and the only person thinking about what the team should work on. And that can be really unfortunate because you miss all these other voices. So try and get all the people in your ecosystem. So if you have a support team, make sure they're represented. If you have, um, I don't know, salespeople, make sure they're represented because they'll all have an opinion on why their thing should be next in priority order. If they can make their case in the same room, then you know, Bob from sales and Joe from support will talk to each other and one of them will acknowledge that the other, you know, the other person's request is actually more important. But if you've got a product owner just taking that off to one side, then everybody questions the outcome. So you know you've got finite time, you know you've got finite resources, but if you're in the same room talking about it, then you, you, know, you all appreciate what you're working with and appreciate you're doing your best with it. So the team are also a stakeholder as well. So this is, this is a really important thing uh, that gets missed so often. Uh, but don't just plan features. Like if there's technical work you need to do, if there's things from the retrospective, you need to make sure they happen. And the way to do that is to include them in your plan. So it's better to set goals than to dictate a methodology. So if you have very, very prescript, uh, prescriptive tickets that tell people, you know, go and build exactly this thing in exactly this way, you're losing a lot of uh, people's creativity. You're losing a lot of the inputs to that discussion. So instead of doing that, try and set an outcome or just an area to make better. So if you say to you, know, you three, can you work on the login page this week? Just make it better. You know, we've got some customer complaints that have said this and this. But you, know, you guys go and come up with what do you think is the, most, you know, the best improvement you can do. That's a much different conversation to you know, do exactly this. Um, because the more people whose ideas you have going into this, the better the outcome will get. Um, and that will probably change the direction of the product quite considerably, especially if, you're, if you've got this collaborative feedback loop with a product owner or something. And if, you, if you're building these small demos and you know, what do you think of this and then change it again, you can end up in a very different direction to if you just planned that at the start of the sprint. Um, one of the sort of things that you sometimes see teams resort to is then having like a definition of ready so when, when teams like, you know, I won't work on this unless it's got like full acceptance criteria or full requirements, that's a bit of an anti-pattern because what you're saying there is, is I don't want to be involved in deciding what gets done. Just give me the thing and I'll do it. That's a real waste. Uh, and actually, like, if you, if you want to go that way, it can turn out pretty bad for you. So estimation is a huge topic. I'm not going to go deep into that. Um, Basically, what decisions do your estimates inform? Like, why are you estimating? What decision do you, do you reach? Like, if this feature is an eight, what does that mean? What, what are you going to do based on that? Because um, if you're just doing it as like a, a Tetris thing, like how many, how many tickets can you fit into the two weeks, then it's kind of, you're probably wrong anyway. Um, so one of the things I've seen that, that's quite nice to this is to estimate on two factors. So estimate on effort and risk. So we wouldn't say, like, this story's a three. We'd say this, this story is low, uh, low effort, high risk. So that means it's something that no one's done before, but we think it's small. So if it blows out, you're not surprised because you said it's high risk. You said it might take a lot longer than you think. Um, whereas, you know, building some other thing, it might be very, you know, very straightforward, very mechanical. It's just big. So there's, there's lots of th things that can make a story take a long time. They're not all the same. Uh, and what you find with this as well is the high risk things there's actually a high risk that you might be able to do it quicker than you thought as well because the, the risk is from not knowing the work. And when you start doing the work, you discover what you need to do. And then beyond that, try and think of value instead of cost. So when you're estimating the time something takes, you're saying uh, how long you... Sorry. You're, you're saying the cost of it rather than the value. Um, so if you estimate the value instead, you can then treat that as a constraint. So you can, you can say to people, for example, Go and work on the login page, make it as good as you can, but spend no more than three days. Um, and then that's very open scope, and there might be a lot of things that people can do to make it better within those three days. And you know what it's going to cost you, because it's not going to go beyond that. But it's a very different conversation to saying, like, do exactly this, how long will it take, to saying, like, make this better, you've got a few days. So this is where you get into using scope as your variable. So instead of using time as the variable, you're using the size of it instead. So talk about how much a feature is worth to you and treat that as, as, as a budget and then build the best thing you can that fits within that budget. So you, you might just say, like, what's the most you can learn about this because it's not even been started yet? 
Or you might say, like, um, this is already sort of pretty decent, but just make it a little bit better because there's a demo next week. Or, you know, you can have a much more nuanced conversation around this where you're saying to people, take this thing, make it better towards this outcome, and use this budget to do it. It's a very, very different conversation for, for estimation. And then very much work together on what that, what that might be. So have your product owner in the room. If you, if you can speak to a customer better still, try and get the most you know, the accurate reflection you can of what's most important to work on. So try and plan for small and done. So try and plan small things that have a concrete end to them that you can get too fast. So if you say to people, go and build the sales service, that's big and abstract, and you know, how long will that take? No one can possibly know. But if you, if you try and build a smaller part of that that you can then build on later, that's a very different approach. So it's going to take practice to do this, but it's worth putting the effort into learning how to do. So try and um, look at what's known as the walking skeleton model, where you're putting together a lean version of things, and then you're building it later. So you're getting something that people can use as soon as you possibly can, then adding to it later. And that's very different from saying, like, build this whole feature, then build that whole feature, then build that whole feature. You're saying, like, just make the leanest parts of them that can put together a system, and then we'll add to it later. And then the direction that goes in may change quite dramatically, actually. So you might have a strong idea of what you think is most important to the users, but when you put that in front of them, they think something very different. But if you're building in this particular way, if you're planning in this particular way, then you can take that into account and you can steer. And if you, if you break the work into these small steps, um, try and get to a releasable thing as soon as you can. Because if you, if you define one thing and you fail, you miss the deadline or you, you can't deliver it, then you've got nothing. But if you plan 10 increments and you only manage to do you know, seven or eight or whatever, then you can still ship what you've got and you can improve it later. So we'll end by just looking at some of the ways we can design our own hacks. So what are some, you know, some ways we can design our own little experiments that we can put into practice? So start from a goal. So work out what's the thing you actually need to improve. So again, if you're in an environment where people need convincing that you need to try like changing your processes and try improving things, then you need to put things in their terms. So if you say to most managers, you know, we need a better build system, um, that doesn't really resonate with them. If you talk about what it means to your stakeholders, that's a different conversation. So if you say to people, like, we're losing three hours a week because our build server's not great, if we spent eight hours on, on improving it, we'd, we'd reduce that time. That's a very different conversation to just saying, like, we should work on the build server. Um, talk about cost of delay. Talk about what would it cost us if we don't improve this thing. And then why is this thing more important than the others? Because there's, there's so many things that you can improve at any time. But try and identi identify a thing that will have a big impact. So once you know what that goal is, you can think about how to move towards it. And try and get as many perspectives on this as you can. You're looking for the thing that's simple and has a low cost, because that will make it happen. If you go to people and say things like, we should change programming language, well, that has a very, very high cost. It's very complex. That's a pretty hard sell at best. Um, whereas if you can say to people, like, just try this one smaller idea, much, 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 much higher chance of buying. Do you actually have everything you need to implement it? Like, if you identify that you want to try a certain thing, but you need to learn a particular skill first, then you need to plan it. That's part of the cost of implementing the change. You need to plan that in. So when you're designing your experiment, it's a good idea to define what better looks like. So if you can define what, what are the expected benefits, um, and also what else might be affected, then you know what you can look at. So you probably have a good idea of what you hope will happen. And then from that, you can make success criteria. So if you say that you're looking to improve um, code quality, that's a very abstract thing. Um, but you might be able to come up with some ways that you might know if you've done it or not. So if you can say, for example, um, we know we've improved code quality if the cyclomatic complexity goes down, you can track that. Or you might say um, we get fewer um, fewer comments per pull request or something like that. You know, what's, what's an observable thing that you'll see if your change goes to plan? And then on the flip side, what could go wrong with your change? So every time you're changing something, we're in a complex system where we don't know what the impact might be. So have a think in advance. What are the trade-offs? Like, if we do this thing, what might look bad or be bad about it? So for example, you might say, let's try and improve uh, code quality. Let's try TDD. 
that's probably going to make you go slower while you learn how to do it. But if you capture that in advance, then it's not a surprise when it happens. And if, if you can say to, to people at management who are interested in your experiments, we're going to try TDD because we think it'll improve code quality. We do think this will make us slower for a couple of weeks. That's, again, it's a very different conversation to having a manager come back to you in your second week of trying TDD and saying, oh, why is everything taking so long? Um, it changes the way the experiment will go. So think about what things might be impacted um, in a way that you weren't planning for. You know, what things are people worried might happen? Because if you can capture these things early, you can, you can adapt and respond to them. So it's a good idea to define some failure criteria as well. So define, like, when can we call this thing a win and when should we call it a loss? Like, if we see something else happen that's not ideal, we should probably stop the experiment. So don't go overboard on this. Like, it's easy to go sort of you know, hyper-negative and talk about everything that can possibly go wrong, but do think about it. Because it, it's, there's nothing worse than trying something and then people come to you and, you know, did you mean this to happen? Or no, you know, panic. Um, if you can have the conversation, just think about it first, then it changes the conversation later on. So when you're designing um, the experiment, start with what are you going to do? So how, how are you going to turn this into action? Like what's an actual step you can take, preferably now or tomorrow, to actually put this into effect? Think about how long the experiment should run for. So if you say you're going to try TDD, but we're going to do it for a day, well, you're not really going to see results because it's a skill that takes time to learn. You're going to need longer than that. So think about how long you should run the experiment for, for before you expect to see a change. And then a really important one is how will you roll it back if it doesn't go to plan? So if you say, like, we're going to rewrite everything in a different language, um, not only does that have a really high cost, the rollback's also really hard as well. So you're, you're gambling everything that your change is going to make things better, um, and you can't do anything about it if it doesn't. Um, whereas if you think about how you're going to roll it back, hopefully you won't need to, but at least you can if you do need to. So a good experiment has high expected benefits, it changes the important things, low expected costs, will give you fast feedback and can be rolled back. Um, so hopefully that gives you some ideas, some things you can maybe try instantly, um, hopefully you can design your own things, um, and please share the best ones. So I've set up a little site um, with this content on, I'll put the slides up as well, uh, and share, share your ideas. Thank you very much. Do we have time for questions? OK. Any questions? So how do I motivate my team to want to act? OK. OK. Um, so uh, again, your whole team need to understand why it's worth doing. Um, so talk to them. Um, and it's not about, you know, don't do these things for the sake of doing them. Do them if they will help you. Or, and again, try them if you think they might help you, but know that you can roll them back if they don't. Um, so it's, it's an interesting question. So do you have a team that, like, they're not interested in change? Or? Correct. I mean, they're okay. just interested in doing more work. Okay. OK. Um, it's an interesting question. <laughs> um, what, what are they incentivized by? Like, what are they rewarded for? Getting more work. So, OK, so in that case, you can, you can say to them that if you improve this thing, you can go faster. You can get even more work done. Yeah. Um, and again, so look for the thing yeah. that, sorry? They're skeptical, but yeah. Um, yeah. Right. So, so in that case, you probably you'd probably just want to encourage them to try it. And if they don't like it, they can roll it back. But just, you know, give it a try. So, you know, just may maybe nominate a week or something where you try one thing. Um, and if it goes well, you keep it. And if you don't, if you don't like it, drop it. Um, actually, one of the things that's quite powerful to do is to make a point of doing something that will go badly and to make a point of dropping it uh, because it can show people that it, they're not stuck with the outcome. So, you know, if you come up with an idea that people want to try and try it, and people don't like it, then show them it's gone tomorrow. You know, you're not stuck with it at all. Um, one of the things that people are often scared of is having change imposed on them. 
So you need to show people that it's not going to be imposed on them. It's something that you, you can do if it's worked for everyone, not that you're going to do because I say so or something. So, so that's probably an angle to look at as well. And as I say, look for the incentives. Look for what they're driven by and show how the change you're suggesting can help them with the thing they care about. Anything else? Anything else? Um, so, so thank you very much. Um, come and say hello. If you've got any other questions, if you want to talk about anything, um, I'll be around. Say hello.